is uh, live in, in about now or late, maybe 10 seconds. There's a bit of a de- delay. Okay. <laughs> okay. There you go. All right, and we're live. <laughs> Hello, welcome everyone joining us. Um, I don't have the YouTube up currently. I'm not sure how many people are live with us right now, but those of us joining can just pop in in the message board and um, say where you're tuning in from in Texas. Just while we wait a minute for a few more people to come through the chat. We are here live with Texas Real Food. Um, We also have Team G Ranch with us today. So um, just waiting for a few more folks to come through. I'll get started in just about 30 seconds. Welcome to the event this evening. Okay. Okay, well, thank you to everyone who is tuning in to the social circle this evening. I'm Rachel, I'll be hosting and moderating the event. I've been working for Texas Real Foods to coordinate this event tonight and all other social circle events. We also have Tim from Texas Real Food who is moderating our chat for any questions. Um, And in a moment, I'll introduce our panelists. First, I just want to introduce our host, Texas Real Food. Um, For those of you who don't know, Texas Real Food is the number one directory for all local food and agriculture businesses in Texas. We promote a closer relationship with food and ingredients for all Texans. This series, The Social Circle, is events that are aimed at budding gardeners and homesteaders, and we're really excited about tonight's event of Backyard Chickens. This evening, we'll get to know all the basics, and we're really excited we get to learn about this topic for just about an hour, um, and then we'll have plenty of time in the end for questions. There will be, yeah, about 30 minutes at the end for all questions. Feel free to submit your questions at any point whenever they pop into your head. And as I mentioned, Tim, who is moderating the chat, will pull out any questions that um, are relevant that we are not going to cover during the event. Um, So, yeah, he'll be collecting them to uh, read to our, our guests at the end. I also want to let everyone know that this event will be recorded. So if you have to leave early, You can always watch it. It'll be on our YouTube channel. And the recording, along with any relevant links and resources, will also be sent out by email. So if you signed up on our Eventbrite, you'll be able to get an email with all the links that that you want. Um, Of course, our our speaker's website and all their relevant links um, and all of that, as as, as well as the video. So... There's that. And then to our speakers. So we have um, Team G Ranch with us. <laughs> um, they've been raising chickens for years. They offer classes on how to clean them. Um, and they're just passionate about making sure people have the means to take food production into their own hands. So I'll let you take it away and introduce yourselves. Um, And then we can move on to questions and whatnot from there. So, welcome. (laughs) Hi. Hi, how are y'all doing? I'm BJ. I'm Amora. Yes. So, we are the uh, founders and owners of uh, Team G Ranch. We're a a Christian therapy ranch that uh, raises multiple animals, but chickens are the primary uh, 
Yeah, we um, we have our ranch. BJ is a, a licensed pastoral counselor, and so he sees people out here, and we've found <clears throat> a way to um, Im- involve all the things that we love, which is the, the counseling, meeting people, teaching people how to be self-sustainable, and um, chickens were the gateway to all of that about 15 years ago. So we have over 200 chickens on our property right now. Um, and we do multiple things with them, uh, raise them for eggs, uh, meat. Uh, we do slaughter classes and, and stuff like that just to teach people how to be more self-sufficient um, on a day-to-day basis. Great. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to learn <laughs> everything that you have to say. I think it's also really exciting the therapy that you incorporate into your work. On our first social circle, we had one of our gardeners who also incorporated therapy into the gardening that she did. So I think it's just a funny little theme that we've randomly carried through throughout the social circle um, series, so. Yeah, you, you gain a lot of connectivity with yourself when you get back to nature. So I think that's something that a lot of us don't experience as much as we were created to experience. And a lot of people end up taking it for for granted where your your food comes from, you know, whether it's meat products or vegetables. A lot of people don't realize that there's actually a process in in how it's raised and how it's slaughtered and the whole nine yards, so. Yeah. I completely understand. Yeah, it's a it's a crucial form of therapy that I feel like we're missing out on in our daily lives. Um, so with that, I also just want to go into what I like to do with all of the social circle events so far, which is just start with kind of our intention, a way that we can ask ourselves why we tuned into this event this evening. Um, and question, you know, my, why might someone want to start raising chickens and maybe why y'all decided to start raising chickens as well? Well, the most obvious answer is for the eggs and for the meat. Um, they have lots of other benefits too. They're good pest control. They um, even eat small snakes and small mice. And um, they're a good way to compost. You can feed them your kitchen scraps, and then you can also compost their waste. So nothing really goes to waste when you have chickens. Um, There's other really good reasons. The farm fresh eggs, free range eggs are way better than store-bought eggs. They're really delicious and creamy. They have a a bright orangey yellow yolk that people that just buy HGB or grocery store eggs aren't used to. Um, They have nice firm whites. They're easy to be kept up with, so <clears throat> you can keep them in your yard, uh, hens especially. If you're just uh, keeping chickens for eggs, for the consumption of eggs, you don't need a rooster, so just the hens alone are very quiet for the most part, um, and they're easy to manage. So you can keep them in a small backyard and, and still not disturb the neighbors. Mm-hmm. And they're really easy to take care of because you can leave them for a couple of days with some water and, make, and they can forage through the yard for their own food. Um, so minimal food is, is also a bonus for chickens as well. Yeah. Um, one of the big reasons <clears throat> that everyone that is possible, that can possibly keep chickens should keep chickens is to do your part in, in our community. Um, last year during the snowstorm that we had, because we had so many chickens and they're, they're really hardy. They do well in heat, they do well in cold. Um, our chickens were out walking around in the snow and still laying. And so because of that, we were able to offer eggs to people who, when the grocery stores ran out, we were able to send a message out on Facebook and next door and say, we've got plenty of eggs. Um, and we were able to, to support our community in that way when everybody was stressed about what they were gonna eat. Yeah. There's this graphic here that you just put up. It actually, that, this graphic is from 1918. And it, this used to be the norm where every house, no matter if you were in a neighborhood or on land, had a couple of hens in the backyard. And it was actually seen as a way to 
take care of each other and mm. you had enough for your family and you were able to sort of a, a bumper crop of eggs and meat and it was always available and so it was just everybody doing their part to help each other out and it's such a small easy thing to do even kids can be responsible for the chickens mm. and it's a good mental break as well you mm. know uh more would come home from work mm-hmm. and the kids would say where's mom and she'd be out in the chicken coop just sitting there watching the chickens and talking to them mm. and so i mean it's just a good mental break they're they're simple they're uh fun to watch yeah they're just fun to watch they do crazy things and so it's just something fun but something that you can also uh sustain off of as well yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I, i've also heard they have a, a big ecological impact on uh, bugs in the grass, especially if you have kids, right? They um, eat ticks and then, I'm, you know, then produce eggs for you as well. So I'm sure that's kind of a hand in hand benefit. Yes. That I've heard of. Um, cool. Well, that's certainly some good reasons as to why we might all want to start raising chickens. Um, the next question is what items do you really need to start, <laughs> right? Um, how much on average will it cost? Is there a chance you might actually have some of those things in your house? So you provided a few great photos of um, a lot of these things and I'm excited to show them. So I guess let's start with um, with the chickens themselves. Huh? <laughs> yeah. This The first picture is actually proof of our chickens being out in the freeze. They're walking on what's normally a little water trough and it turned into ice, so. Oh, that's wow, I didn't even notice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so hens are, you know, like we stated before, hens are relatively easy to keep. Uh, you don't need a rooster if you're just using them for eggs. That's a common misconception that a lot mm-hmm. of people, there's people off from having chickens yeah. usually is that they think they need a rooster and that's not allowed. But, so. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, you, I mean, it's not, they, they, the hens are going to produce the eggs whether you have a rooster or not. Now, if you want baby chicks, that's where the rooster comes into play uh, to fertilize the eggs so that you can incubate and, and hatch them. Um, but for basic uh, chickens, I mean, a coop is, is uh, very uh, important. Um, <clears throat> you do need more than one bird. Chickens are social animals. Um, so one lone chicken would be lonely. Yeah. So with your coop ideas, I mean, there's plenty of different coops that you can make uh, anything from, I mean, zero dollars on up to, um, I mean, a lot. $4,500. Yeah. I mean, uh, we built a chicken condo for our our chickens, you know, that's kind of a huge, huge uh, coop, which you can see in the background of one of the uh, the pictures. But um, what you need is to make sure it's predator proof, you know, secure from uh, animals. Uh, dogs, cats, and even foxes and coyotes, depending on where you live, um, <clears throat> making sure that it, they do have a dry area to be in. So the entire coop doesn't need to be waterproof, but at least a good section of it. So when it does rain or snow, they do have an area to go under to uh, for security. Um, making sure you have nesting boxes. Those are important as well. Uh, whether you're hatching them or you're just eating the eggs, that's where they're gonna lay their eggs. So making sure that you have uh, enough nesting boxes for your hens Typically one box will, will tailor to three or four chickens so or hens. So, you know, just calculating based off of what you have, uh, making sure that you have enough. These are some good examples of <clears throat> really recycled options you can use for coops coming through. And then, um, <laughs> oh yeah, also on two. <laughs> there is a... Uh, also some good these are good nesting box options nest. so yeah. the first one is kind of what we have and we got a ton of them because we thought that every chicken needed its own nesting box mm-hmm. and not the case um they'll they'll have their favorites that they use and sometimes you'll see two in the same nesting box laying eggs you don't need one nesting box per every bird um, and they don't have to be these prefab metal ones. There's a couple of good examples of some empty cat litter boxes flipped on their side or Home Depot buckets. Yeah, buckets. The third picture in particular, that's um, a pretty fancy one where the eggs actually roll out instead of sitting in the nesting mm. box. 
for another chicken to come and lay an egg on top of. So it, it doesn't have to be very fancy or it can be as fancy as you want. They don't care. They're gonna lay either way. Yeah, do you another separate the <laughs> nesting boxes from the coop? How is that set up? No, so like in the pictures that you're showing right here, the nesting boxes mm -hmm. are actually in the coop. So they, mm -hmm. our hens will lay, they typically lay from morning sun up to around one or two in the afternoon. Uh, by three or four, they're done. I go check eggs around three or four in the afternoon and they're done. So I usually close up the nesting boxes so they don't sleep in them because you don't want them sleeping and pooping and stuff in there. Um, but yeah, you definitely want them in the coop, in the dry area. That's where the, the dry area comes in place. Um, but also having enough ventilation is important as well, because not just for smell, but for uh, keeping them cool in the summertime, especially with Texas heat. Uh, they get in there and they start working up an egg. It's, it's almost like giving birth. Not that I know what giving birth is like, but um, they're, they're laying the egg and, it, and you can hear them actually laying the egg because they're making the noise and uh, getting loud. With it. Um, so making sure they have enough ventilation so that they're getting airflow um, into the area. Yeah. And that's <clears throat> specific to Texas. Well, all coops need ventilation, um, but a Texas coop looks a lot different than a Montana coop because they have to deal with different elements. And so our coop is mostly open. They have the dry area that we just mm -hmm. talking about. They have the cup, the wind breaks, um, but our coop isn't actually four sides closed in. A lot of people do have those and that's okay, but the ventilation is most hard. And just also making sure that your coop is tailored to your area. Um, so the coop that's actually on, on the screen right now to the left is our one of what we use for our meat birds. Uh, we call it a chicken tractor and it's just a small coop that protects the, the meat birds as they grow um, and free range into the grass. But you know, in our area, the most common predators here are skunks, raccoons, and foxes that will come in the night. But during the day, we have to worry about hawks. So I mean, it's but it, in reality, it's it's just a circle of life. You know, uh, we may come home and, and have a chicken that's missing because a hawk got it during that, throughout the day. But in the evening, we try to do our best to protect our flock because they are you know our meat and our eggs and our money. So and that's a risk. <clears throat> that you can choose to take or not to take, whether you're deciding between having an enclosed, a fully enclosed run and so your chickens stay in that all day, every day, and it's big enough for them. And for that, you need about three square feet of space per chicken. Um, mm -hmm. Or the other option is free range, which is what we Joe was saying that we do. So during the day or a certain number of hours a day, you can let them out and they can just go and pick around in the yard. That's not always an option for some people. Um, if your chickens are sharing a yard with the dog, that's not the best option. Or if but you're trying to hide them from an HOA. Or if you're trying to hide them from an <laughs> HOA. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of options no matter what your circumstances. So there's not a whole lot of barriers to having chickens. Yeah. And a lot of people, you know, have different elements of their coop. So like for us, our feeders are in the dry area. Our water is in the wet area or the uh, exposed to the elements. Mm -hmm. Our coop doesn't have an automatic door um, for our main coop, but a lot of people do put automatic doors on their coops so they don't have to manage them during the day. They just, it automatically opens up at sunrise and automatically close it as the sun goes down. Um, the only problem with that is if one day for us, like if there's a predator around, and we know it, we'll keep our chickens locked up for a day or two just to get the predator gone. Um, mm -hmm. It's letting them out and, and just providing a buffet for, for the fox or the skunk or whatever. So if you have an automatic door, you always got to have that mindful, oh, do I need to keep it locked or whatnot? So, um, but it, that is a cool option as well. Um, first aid mm -hmm. is, is big because chickens do get sick. They're just like any other animal, any other pet that you have. Um, some of the things, I'll let more explain some of the things we have in our first aid kit. Yeah, and we've built it up sometimes after the fact as we were learning. And so we yeah. didn't have all of this stuff in our arsenal before we got chickens. We, um, but we've got electrolytes for when you bring new birds home or when they're, there's a sick bird and you want to isolate it and get some extra electrolytes or probiotics. Um, we've got VetRx, which is a liquid, it's very similar to like Vicks for a human, you put it on. So if they 
if the chickens have a respiratory problem, it gives the same, um, yeah, it doesn't heal them, but it gives them the relief like Vicks would for humans. Um, there's a couple different, Corid and Triamulex and Denigard, those are some common things if you have different chicken ailments that are good to have around. There's, um, we have blue coat, which you spray if chicken has an injury. Um, chickens see red, that's why you'll notice a lot of the, um, the waterers and feeders you find at the store have the red bottom is because that's the color that chickens see. And so if they have an injury that's red, you spray some blue coat or some no pet on it and it turns it blue so that the other chickens aren't constantly pecking, pecking at that wound. Hmm. Um, you can give them Neosporin, uh, Nutrigent. So again, if there's a sick chicken, it's kind of like a, a vitamin sugar boost to get them feeling better. Chickens can get egg bound sometimes. And so you can give them an Epsom salt bath to help relieve that, that issue. Egg constipation. Egg, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this selenium for there's a thing that they can get. It's a, it's a vitamin deficiency. And, um, they get rhinic, so their neck actually folds backwards. It looks like they can't hold their neck. So selenium is good to have around for that. But all these things we've kind of. It's a learning process. Yeah, sometimes we had a sick on a group and said, we have these symptoms. What do we do for it? And there's a lot of people out there that are willing to help and participate in getting your chickens better. And a lot yeah, of that, I mean, yeah. Oh no, I was gonna say a lot of that turns on your flock as well. I mean, some of the smaller flocks, you're not gonna never need any of this because there's not that much to it. Um, ours again, you know, we have over 200 chickens, so it, there's a lot that goes into it, so. And they do have more because they're free range. Mm -hmm. um, but that's okay. a, we feel like the benefits for us outweigh keeping them locked up. Exactly. All day. Definitely. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, my original question was what items do you need and you know, what might you already have lying around? And I guess from old cars to, you know, <laughs> child's, child's play uh, structures to Neosporin, you know, that's something that I wouldn't even think had to be added to the list, but um I'm sure you acquire just more and more things too. Yeah, as you raise as you raise chickens. Yeah, you could essentially have chickens for zero dollars. Mm -hmm. Just using stuff around the house to yeah. to for your coop and feeders and and uh, box plain boxes. So right, I think let's see the other photo that you had here was. Um, the different met, uh, the different wires. Maybe we could talk about that, and then also um, floor options a little more for the chicken coops before we move on. So the one on the on the left with the, the full hand in it is chicken wire. That's your traditional chicken wire. They're typically about an inch hole, um, and then the and that's, that's good at keeping chickens in. Yes, um, the one on the right is what's called. Uh, Hardware cloth. Hardware cloth, yes. And that's a finer, stronger wire. Um, that's good for keeping predators out. Um, so our coop is actually built of both. It has chicken wire all the way around it and then hardware uh, wire all the way, hardware, hardware cloth all the way around the, the bottom half of it. So skunks or raccoons can't stick their hands through the holes and grab a chicken because they will do that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a little extra protection to keep predators out. <clears throat> it, would be, it would be our first choice is to do everything completely in hardware cloth. It is more expensive. Um, and we started with chicken wire, but then we noticed small mice can get through those holes mm -hmm. or snakes can get through those holes. Or like you said, raccoons can poke their hands in those holes. So we added that hardware cloth at the bottom. A learning process again. And then as far as the flooring goes, you know, um, we use shavings, you know, it's, it's actually our coop is on the ground. Um, and then we, we just use shavings on it. And as the shavings compost, we just add uh, more shavings to it. So we don't ever remove the shavings. We just keep adding to it because it composts itself down. And well, we do remove the shavings, not once a week. like yeah. people. So that's called the deep letter method. And when you do the deep letter method, the nature takes its course underneath basically and composts underneath and then you add fresh shavings on top and the heat underneath 
creates that compost. And so that's mutually beneficial because you're not cleaning the coop every other day or every week. Um, mm -hmm. And then when you do clean the coop out, you can use all that free compost. Mm -hmm. Hmm. For gardening or... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. You can also use sand um, mm -hmm. or pebbles. Yeah. Um, and is that the most important in the in the nesting boxes here? Because you definitely have some photos too of um yeah, just having grass at the bottom versus hay and other materials in the nesting boxes. Yeah, so we, um, in our nesting boxes, we also use shavings, people use hay. That keeps the eggs clean. Um, so we change out. We don't do the deep litter method in the nesting boxes, that's a good point. We, we do that every few days, we can't put fresh shavings in to make sure that everything is clean. That makes sense. Um, okay, well, I think your next slides are about where to get your chickens. So I know you're kind of in the Austin area. Um, <laughs> so maybe getting chickens in your local area, what breeds of chickens you recommend, um, if you recommend other places for people in Texas to get chickens. So there's a few different ways to get chickens. So you can use your like your local people like us. We hatch chickens and we sell them. Um, or places like Tractor Supply, Callahan's. That's a local Callahan's is a local area, uh, like a ranch um, feed store, store feed store uh, in Austin. Tractor Supply. A lot of people are familiar with that. Um, Ideal Poultry is another one that if you wanted to get mass varieties um, or large quantities. Yeah. Um, They're in Cameron and they don't allow you to go on their farm to pick. So you, that's an online order only. Mm -hmm. um, Windy Meadow Hatcheries is for like meat birds. You know, if you wanted to order uh, meat birds to, to, to raise so that you can, you know, slaughter for, for meat, obviously. Um, and then Facebook, Craigslist, neighborhood pages, you know, there's, there's always people on there trying to sell or even give away chickens. But, you know, we recommend making sure that you, you do the vetting process because some people have sick chickens they're trying to get rid of. Um, so just making sure that you, you know who you're getting it from. And when you do get a new chicken or new hen or rooster in, you, you quarantine them for a couple of days just to make sure that there is no elements ailments that you're bringing into your flock um, because one bad chicken or one sick chicken can literally destroy your entire flock. Um, and so just being cautious when you go to uh, people who are not as reputable or that you don't know. So the quarantining is um, good for you quarantine them to keep them away. And then the stress that it does put on them moving into a new environment will bring out some underlying mm -hmm. Ill illnesses that you may not have seen when you went to pick them up from the place that they were used to being at, so. And it's also good to, when you move a new chicken in or a new set of chickens in, to do it in the evenings when they're already roosting and they're getting ready for bed. This way, when they wake up, the new chickens are already part of the flock and it's not somebody coming in, like uh, they don't get territorial. Uh, so you don't have a new chicken coming in and they're like, who are you? Uh, so doing it at night in the evening time is always the best or, or early morning while it's still dark before they start moving around. Yeah. And the pecking order is a real thing. So you will see mm -hmm. any disturbance in figuring out who's the authority and who's the hens are in charge. You will notice that yeah. for a few days after that's normal and it happens. They sort it all out between them. And if you have roosters with your hens, um, like we do, you know, we have several roosters you have the group of hens that will follow a particular rooster. So mm -hmm. if you get a new rooster into the flock and he tries to mess with somebody's hens, mm -hmm. that, that the other rooster will definitely let him know, um, hey, these are my girls, you know, stay away. Uh, so that's another thing to keep in mind with the pecking order. If you see your roosters fighting, it's just, they're just trying to show who's the alpha and who's not, you know? And so it's not a big deal unless they really start going at it, but... Um, one thing this second picture reminded me we didn't touch on in what you need in your coop is roosts. And so mm -hmm. these are just branches that BJ cut down from trees around our property that we use. It. And it can be as simple as that or closet rods or- Anything roundish. Some people use two by fours. So that was deferment. Yes. Um, 
So when, when you're looking for chickens, back to that part though, there's diff- you need to know what you're looking for, mm-hmm. not necessarily what breed you're looking for, but do you want chicks? Do you want full-blown hens that are already laying? Do you want pullets? And pullets are in between chick and hen. They're like that teenage age. Um, so most chickens will start laying anywhere between 20 and 26 weeks around there. So pullets, like we've got some that we just sold last week that were around nine, nine to 10 weeks old. And so they'll start laying in another 10 weeks. So it's good just to know what you're gonna, what you wanna look for, what stage Mm -hmm. of the development do you wanna be accountable for? And then also when you go to get chicks, you know, you need to know if you're getting straight run, which is kind of a mix of hens and could possibly have roosters in it. Um, We sell a lot of straight runs um, or pullets, which are all hens. And so usually when you get them like from tractor supply, they'll come pre-sex. So, you know, they're hens or roosters. Um, but and know that that's, that's not, not always work. <laughs> it, it's not always a hundred percent. It's really hard to sex a chicken. So yeah, just knowing what you're looking for, um, whether you're, and also are you looking for layers? Are you looking for meat birds? Are you looking for dual purpose chickens, um, decorative chickens? Uh, what, what, just knowing what you're looking for is a big deal. Um, you can get eggs from silkies, but they're, they're not a, a large egg. So, you, you know, two eggs will, will not even be the size of one normal egg from a, like a Rhode Island red. But they so, can be pretty consistent layers. Yes. And they're, they're pretty to look at. So it's just kind of knowing what you're looking, what you're looking for as well. So I'll let more talk about some of the breeds though. Yeah. So have. these that are up on the screen right now are some of our favorites. We have, a, they're all our favorites. Um, <laughs> like the, our kids. Yeah. There's a, a Swedish flower, Rooster. Um, the one on the right at the front is a Rhode Island red. And those are a great, um, the, the brown grocery store eggs that you get are usually from Rhode <coughs> Island Reds or Red Sex Links that look very similar to this. Mm-hmm. The one right behind it is a Leghorn. Um, the white one. That's where the Foghorn Leghorn name came from. And those are the white eggs that you see at the grocery store. Okay. Yeah. The one right in the middle on the left, that's an Americana or Easter Acre. Those lay the colored, they can lay blue, green, pink, mm-hmm. olive. Eggs. Those add the variety of the egg colors. That's next. <laughs> the one on the left, that's a, a Brahma. And the one on the right, those are BJ's favorite. Those are the, the Bard Plymouth rocks, those like nice big brown eggs too. Pretty, so many different patterns too on their feathers. Yeah, yeah. so some people um, sometimes, oh, that left one also is an Easter egg. So she'll lay colored eggs. She usually lays on green eggs. You can see her little cheek fluff is just starting to come in. Um, so sometimes people will, to keep it all straight, if you get lots of chickens, um, they'll do one breed per year or per purchase. So this year they'll get all Rhode Island reds and then next year they'll get all Leghorns, and then the next year they'll get all barred rocks, so you can age them and remember how old mm-hmm. your chickens are. Is it Perfect. beneficial to have a large variety at the same time? As personal mm-hmm. preference, um, mm-hmm. personal we like preference. Yeah. ones because we like yeah. the different colored eggs and mm-hmm. the different. But there's not a disadvantage to having all the same. So for us, like when we hatch eggs, ours are, are truly like a farm straight run mix barnyard. because yeah, barnyard mix. We don't um, separate our chickens. If we wanted to do all Easter eggers, we do have uh, an Americana rooster and then a couple Americana hens that we could separate into a separate uh, kennel of, of sorts. So they could we could start breeding those if we wanted to breed them. Pure. Exactly, pure eggs. Mm-hmm. Um, but right now we don't, we don't do that typically. Um, so when we hatch an egg, you may get, um, like the one that's up right now kind of has red and then it has some white in it. We got some that are gray and red. Um, so it's just kind of a true mixed breed of, and they're pretty, they're pretty, pretty chickens. They're just mixed breed. Yeah. Um, so. And that's what we like. I think we have a few more (laughs) breeds, roosters, (laughs) maybe. These are both names. Roosters. 
The next one I think is roosters, huh? Yes? <laughs> yeah, those are roosters. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. So the one on the left is our OG. He's one of our original roosters that we had since we've uh, had this flock. Um, and then the one on the right is a neck and neck rooster. Um, so he, those are both purebred uh, roosters. Yeah, so the one on the left, he's a, a golden laced wine dot. Hmm. And so you only need roosters if you're trying to produce chicks, just to clarify, right? Correct. Yes, ma'am. They're also beneficial if like us, we have a lot of land and they do free range. And so they're good predator protection. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they will protect their flocks. So the roosters themselves are good protectors. Yeah, you'll hear stories of them fighting off hawks or fighting a possum that's small, trying to come yeah, in. Small yeah. animal. They'll do their part to protect <clears throat> their flock. It's in, yeah, it's interesting to hear about the pecking order that you talk about too, because it also reminds me again that chickens as much as you might be raising them for the eggs or the meat, they are pets at the end of the day too. And you have to, you know, carefully introduce your new dog to your cat, you know, just like mm -hmm. you have to introduce chickens to each other. Um, so that was interesting to, to think about. Um, okay, the next photo we have is ooh, on top of each other. Um, <laughs> We have pumpkins, <laughs> chickens eating uh, pumpkins. So this yeah, is just so some of the feed that we feed is a lot of kitchen scraps. So that's pumpkins. Uh, Garden scraps. Exactly. Uh, around the Halloween, we try to go get uh, all the excess pumpkins after uh, Thanksgiving and Halloween, so that we can feed all our animals because yeah. our cows like it. But, you know, pigs love it, and the chickens love it. So it's just kind of a of a treat for them. We'll so just, a lot of people in the neighborhood were dropping pumpkins off at our yeah. mailbox. They'd buy eggs yeah. from us and then drop pumpkins yeah. off. So. <laughs> mm. um, but that's just a, a simple, inexpensive or free way, really, uh, to feed your animals or to feed your chickens. Um, y yes, you can buy feed. We do supplement some of the feed, uh, and especially in the wintertime, uh, with uh, actual store-bought feed. Layer pellets. Layer pellets. That just helps keep the protein up and stuff like that. Um, but for the most part, we try to feed them as much uh, natural or home, you know, vegetables or, or our kitchen waste, so to speak. Yeah. You can um, <clears throat> ferment that, that feed that you buy or grains. Um, and so you'll, you'll ferment it in water for a couple of days and it expands the feed. It makes it last longer. It introduces really good probiotics to their systems. And mm. so... The, the, a bag of feed is about $20 for a 50 pound bag. And so fermenting can stretch that $20 for you. Um, we do garden scraps at the end of the season. I opened up the garden and let the chickens go in there and dig around and it was free labor. They were tilling for us and any herbs, if you have an abundance of herbs, I know people grow fodder trays so it's just seeds that they grow to into like microgreens basically and offer those to the chicken we do always have ground oyster shells or egg shells you can um, dry out their egg shells and grind them up and that introduces more calcium and we do that free style so we just have a bowl of it and if a chicken needs it then they have it and that helps keep their eggshells nice and hard. So if you get <clears throat> free range chicken eggs, you'll notice that they're harder to crack than the regular HEB eggs. Yeah, grocery store eggs. But it is also important to know if you do recycle your eggshells like we do is that you grind them up or crush them to a, a, as fine as possible. This way they don't get used to seeing an egg and wanting to crack it recognize and eat it. it. So they don't mm -hmm. recognize it as an egg. So it, it's more of a vitamin uh, supplement for them. So that's one important thing to keep in mind. Chickens are really good about knowing what's good for them and what's not. So they know that if it's poisonous, they don't eat it. Stay or they know if they're lacking in calcium, they'll go for those oyster shells. Mm -hmm. well, I guess birds need calcium. Yeah, just like any other organism, huh? Um, speaking of needing calcium to produce strong eggshells, okay. I guess the next thing to go into is just 
collecting eggs. Um, and when you, when you can start collecting eggs and we'll go into a little bit of chicken science with this one. I'm excited about this slide. <laughs> Well, so like we mentioned earlier, they start laying around 20 to 26 weeks. A lot of that, there's variance between the breeds and the size of the chickens. Some of those, like we mm -hmm. mentioned Sophie's earlier, some of those don't even start laying until up to about a year old. So that's one thing to keep in mind when you're looking at what kind of chickens you want is how long are you willing to wait for those eggs, um, which may not be a big deal if you're just looking at them for decoration, but they do lay the most when in the spring and summer, early autumn, what they need is 12 to 14 hours of sunlight a day to create an egg. And that egg is created over a 24 hour time period, which is what the graphic shows on the right. Um, go through the whole thing. Uh, well, I guess I don't, Think we should go through the whole thing but there are on the right hand side when you're buying eggs from the grocery store you'll notice different labels those matter um, it's it's good to know what those are so farm fresh the way we got started raising chickens the first chickens that we got was because i watched a video of what happens with chickens in factory farms and how they live and the conditions that they have that they live under and I was really sad. And so I didn't want to eat eggs from chickens that came from that environment. Um, so that's why knowing farm fresh means that those eggs are less than 21 days old, that they are from a farm. Um, value added is eggs that have, or chickens that are fed like extra omega threes. And so they can say that those eggs have those extra vitamins in them. Um, free range for us means we have 200 chickens on about 17 acres, but there are minimum requirements. And so they need to have one acre for every 400 hens is what classifies it, class, or enables you to be able to label them free range. Um, organic eggs are all, everything that that hen eats is organic. The land that that hen walks around on and pets from is organic, is classified organic. So there are specific certifications that you have to get to be labeled organic, which is why a lot of people that say that they, or a lot of people won't say specifically that they have organic eggs because they don't have that label. That label. Mm -hmm. um, they haven't gone through the proper chambers <clears throat> to get that specific label, but technically, yes, their eggs are organic. They just haven't paid for the sort of, for the classification. So also a cool thing about farm fresh eggs, or as I, I always just say, they're farm fresh because they come off the farm. Yeah. So, but I mean, ours are, are free range, you know, chickens, but you don't have to wash them. Um, I mean, you don't have to refrigerate them. So when the ones you get from the HEB or other uh, stores are washed and that's why they're refrigerated and the uh, reason why they're washed is because the usda requires, requires so that all eggs are washed in bleach water so all the eggs that you buy from the grocery store have been soaked in bleach water or washed off in bleach water so so but when you buy eggs from somebody like us or or another farm fresh egg you know they don't typically wash their eggs uh so they we keep all our eggs on the on the counter we have an egg shelf actually uh, so as people come to buy eggs from us, we just put them out in a box for them. They come pick them up, leave the money. Um, and typically they just leave them on their counters as well. Um, it, now, keep in mind, you know, you don't want to leave eggs out for, you know, months and months uh, unrefrigerated or unwashed. But I mean, if you go through them, our typical, um, Realize. yeah, our typical people, you know, who get eggs from us are usually buying weekly or every, you know, bi-weekly. So those eggs don't need to be really be refrigerated at all. And the reason that you can leave the eggs out, um, and really, I think America, we're the ones who do it the most. If you go to most other countries, or if you've been to other countries, they don't refrigerate their eggs. They leave them on the counter. And that's because when the eggs are laid, they have a bloom, which is a protective coating that um, eggshells are porous. And so that bloom seals the pores and, um, 
protects it from protects the egg from being from getting germs and bacteria inside of them. And so the bloom is what keeps the eggs fresh. So when you wash them, you're removing that protective coating, that bloom. And that's why you have to have them refrigerated. But you can, once you do wash them, you can put them in the refrigerator. And if you don't wash them at all, there's even a, a technique called water glassing. So you use some water and some pickling lime and mix that up into a glass jar. And you can put fresh unwashed eggs in that jar of pickling lime and water and keep eggs fresh for up to a year. So anybody who has a post-apocalyptic shelter mm -hmm. can, can do this and have eggs for up to a year. Yeah. There's lots of ways to preserve eggs. You can also um, dehydrate them and make a powder and you scramble that back up and it's like scrambled it. You add water to it and scramble it up. It's scrambled eggs. So eggs are really versatile in mm -hmm. food security. Mm -hmm. So then you get into fertilize or into hatching eggs. So again, you just to have laying eggs, you don't need a rooster, but if you want to hatch them, then you definitely need a rooster because the rooster is what fertilizes the eggs. Um, typically you wanna have uh, one rooster per 10 hens or so, um, just to have a good balance because if you have too many roosters, then they will wear the hens out. Um, and if you don't have enough, then you will be, it's hard to, to make sure, yeah, in balance, it's hard to make sure that the eggs you're getting are fertile. Um, and so it, there is a process and it typically takes about 21 days to hatch an egg or to hatch a chick from, from the egg process. Um, hatching eggs are less than seven days old. They're unwashed um, and then you, you incubate them into, a, a, we have uh, two small incubators that hold 41 eggs each um, and it, they're incubated at a temperature of about hundred degrees. Um, after three to four days, you can start the candling process. And the picture that's up right now on the right, I mean, on the left, is, a, is an actual candled egg from one of our uh, batches of, of hatching eggs. It's probably about a week and a half mm -hmm. in, I think. So you can see the veins. You can see the, the, how the chick is starting to produce. It's uh, Candling is like a, an ultrasound for eggs, if you will, um, just like what a, a pregnant mama would go do, get um, done. So this way, we can see if the eggs are viable uh, for hatching or not. Uh, the ones that aren't, we typically just take out and we throw away because they're no good anymore. Um, but then the ones that are, we, we make sure that we keep them at a good humidity and good temperature um, for the 21 days. And then the picture on the left is actually one of our baby chicks that hatched. Right. I mean, on the right, sorry, or, uh, is one of our baby chicks that hatched. Fresh out of the egg. Fresh out of the egg, yeah. Um, and so a hatching process can take anywhere from an hour, I mean, we've seen them hatch, you know, take over 24 hours to hatch. So it just all depends on how, um, how much that chicken really wants to get out of the egg. <laughs> Some of them are quicker than others. And so uh, typically it's not good though to help a chick hatch because they do have an umbilical cord and, and uh, connected to the egg. So you don't want to pull that off. You want it to be able to come off naturally. Uh, so if you do are hatching eggs and you get uh, a little anxious, excited, excited um, just be patient, let them hatch. You know, um, if they do look like they need help, maybe helping them crack the egg just a little bit, but don't pull any of it apart. Uh, let them naturally do that because you could, you could end up killing them. Yeah. There's a lot of risk in helping them out of yeah. the shell. So if you look right, right above where that chicken's, that chick's beak is, there's, you can kind of see the next one starting. They start poking a little hole in the egg with an egg tooth. It's a little um, hard part at the very tip of their beak. And then they poke all the way around and they make, mm -hmm. they like zip it all the way around mm -hmm. and then they push themselves out of it. So it, it, it's a lot of work. That's why this little chick looks tired. Pathetic. <laughs> tired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But they fluff up within a couple hours and yeah. they look like what you would imagine a chick would look like. Right. Like, uh, like this. Like, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. You know so, how hard it is to get a chick to those, pose for a picture? Those were all our chick, our little baby chicks on our last yeah. round of we hatching. Those. Um, the other way to, is to naturally um, let them brood. So uh, a broody hen uh, is like a, a, 
a mom that's nesting, if you will, um, a pregnant mom that would be nesting. So she actually lays flat and puffs out her, her body. She plucks out all her chest uh, feathers to, to, so that the eggs can go right up against her skin and stay warm. And she provides the, incubati- the incubation and the heat. Um, and she'll stay in that nesting box or wherever you put them for 21 days, only getting up to eat, drink, minimally eat and drink and then poop. Um, other than that, she's sitting on those eggs for 21 days. Um, don't, the benefit to that is that the chicks have a bond with a chicken already as, as, once they're born. Um, and so sometimes if we get a broody hen and we can't break her from that broodiness, we'll take eggs from all the other chickens and put them under her. So we'll have a mixed breed from that one hen, but she didn't lay all those eggs. She doesn't know the difference. And so that's another cool way to, uh, to just incubate it and allow it to happen naturally. Uh, the only problem with that is that sometimes they uh, they stay broody and sometimes they don't. So sometimes they'll snap themselves out of it and then you just wasted all the eggs. And so for me personally, I like to incubate them because I know that they'll be uh, more likes to let them. I like the broody because yeah. it's hands off. They do what they do <laughs> and the strong survive. <laughs> <laughs> so just to clarify too, like one, what percentage of eggs would you say you for like that you have fertilized and that you create tricks out of and and what amount do you just keep as eggs um and and how do you determine that kind of percentage within your own farm so really i (laughs) i'm the one who loves to hatch them Uh, it gives me something Mm -hmm. to do especially since covid i've been working from home a lot Uh, it gives me something to do so uh, i always ask for permission, so to speak, when I can hatch more eggs. Um, and then the, the flip side to that is, is that, you know, we do want to keep our chicken, our egg production up as well. So, you know, keeping fresh flocks coming in because chickens do stop laying eggs after a few years or slow down. Um, and so making sure that we do have young layers uh, as, as the flocks getting older um, to come in and take the place and, and to, to, to take up for the lost chickens the ones that get uh, killed. Um, but so for us, we, there's not really a magic percentage on what we let, uh, what we hatch. Uh, it's just kind of when I get a wild hair, uh, like right now we have uh, about 20 duck eggs and about 20 chicken eggs uh, incubating uh, or so, give or take. And, and it was just because I just wanted to hatch some ducks. Um, as far as fertile eggs, though, we average about a 75% uh, hatch rate, 70, yeah, hatch rate. So out of 41 eggs, you know, uh, the majority of them will be fertile and will hatch. And even some of the fertile eggs don't typically uh, fully form. They get what's called a blood ring around them. Uh, so it's, it, you'll see it when you kindle them, just the ring going around it, meaning it was fertile, but for some reason the chicken didn't develop right. Um, so yeah, we get about a 75, 80% hatch rate when we do incubate. So, uh, which is really good. You know, when we've talked to other hatcheries, you know, they're percentage sometimes is typically 40 to 50 percent so we're above average (laughs) oh nice and do do hens lay eggs year-round they yes and no um they they need that 12 to 14 hours of sunlight so in the summer well per day to create an egg so in the Mm -hmm. summer we'll get tons of eggs yeah six or seven eggs and in the winter, we might get two dozen eggs per day. They just slow down. They need that full sunlight to be able to create that egg. Okay, so you should expect more more eggs in the summer. <laughs> yeah, spring spring to you know spring yes. summer fall when it starts warming up and the sun starts coming. All us chicken people are waiting for the first day of spring. So <laughs> get, our, get, our get the egg. It is something back. good. Um, another thing to consider when you're looking at what kind of chickens you want to get is whether you want that broody gene or not. So those leghorns, those white ones that we showed earlier, those that broody gene has basically been bred out of that breed. And that's because the egg manufacturers don't want to deal with broody hens. They want, you, they want that chicken to lay its egg every day, deliver. They don't want it messing with hormones or anything like that. And so there are some breeds that are more broody than others. And so depending on what you want, you can look into that and see, do you want a more broody one or do you not? And you can break a broody. So like Bijo was saying earlier, 
we'll just put her in, in a cage with a lot of airflow underneath of her to lower her temperature because when she plucks out those chest feathers and her <clears> temperature <throat> starts to warm up and she kind of goes into a, a hormonal trance. She hardly gets up to eat and drink. She doesn't want anybody messing mm -hmm. with her. Lays out flat. And so if you want that, like I want that because I like them doing all the work. <laughs> then that, you don't want to mess with having to break a broody hen or mm. want them to just because when they are broody they don't lay an egg I guess that's also maybe part of the benefit to having a variety of mm -hmm. chickens some are more broody and they'll even nest um nest some of the other types of hens eggs right yeah. <laughs> so, so interesting um Okay, so what about some common problems that you run into and good ways to get around them, fix them? You kind of talked about some health problems, but what else is there? <laughs> well, predators are first and foremost, uh, depending on where you're at. Again, I mean, it could be something as simple as uh, your neighbor's cat, uh, your dog, uh, or like what we have is foxes, skunks, and raccoons that are, are highly, um, are, are big mainly our predators, uh, and hawks, I'm sorry, and hawks. Um, some of the non-animal predators would be like your HOAs. <laughs> um, yeah, so you want to check your city ordinances to see what's allowed in your area. Um, I know the Austin area last year tried to pass um, HB 1686, which was about food security and allowing anybody to have up to six hens in their backyard, even if they were in an HOA, regardless of what the HOA said, um, no roosters. And that actually didn't go through. And so there was a lot of people bummed about that. The next opportunity for that to come up will be in January of next year. So if you want to be a part of encouraging that, you can call the Capitol switchboard and tell the operator your zip code and have them connect you to their, to your Senator. And you can ask the Senator that your Senator to support the Texas food bill, Texas food, food security. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's a hard one to get around mm -hmm. because it's as somebody who loves chickens, it's a little bit frustrating because I think people don't understand that they are, they're not as loud as a barking dog. They're not as invasive as, and like a cat, your neighbor's cat will come and dig up all your mulch. The chickens won't do that. They'll stay kind of contained where they're supposed to be. So they're really easy to have around and really non-bothersome. And they don't smell. Food. Yeah. I mean, you don't have to go picking up poop like dogs or even cats. They don't smell as long as, you know, you regularly. Um, and when I say regularly, maybe, I don't know how can we clean it. Maintain their coop. Yeah, maintain their coop. Putting fresh shavings down is important. Um, the fresh shavings actually helps to, to dampen the smell. Um, what else? Illnesses. I mean, that's another. Really, the people are the problems we run into. Yeah, <laughs> it's really your HOA. People and fighting it. Not, and I think a lot of it's just from ignorance of not knowing, you know, where back in 1918, it was a common, encouraged thing right. for everybody to have chickens in their yard. I think now a lot of HOAs are concerned about what it might do to the neighborhood. Everybody's more concerned about their, their land value than they are about just chickens. Out a lot chickens. Of yeah. I mean, they really do. So, uh, but yeah, that's, there are illnesses from wildlife. One big thing right now is the avian flu. And so if you're around, chicken pages online you'll read a lot about avian flu that's and that comes around every few years mm -hmm. yeah. there's a risk um if a sick bird gets in your area and there's um sick bird droppings in your area you know there's a risk to your flock getting it really though this avian flu thing is affecting major hen houses not necessarily as much backyard chickens. And so you just practice good biosecurity, not wearing the same shoes in your chicken coop as you would wear in a sick chicken coop. 
Mm-hmm. We don't feed outside the chicken coop anymore uh, mm-hmm. right now because we don't want wild birds coming to eat. So we make sure that we're, we keep the feed inside the chicken coop now. Um, so because of the hens and roosters, they'll keep wild birds out of there. They're not going to want to come in there. Um, so that's just preventative maintenance, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. What else can you do? I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a veterinarian type of guy. I mean, I don't take my animals to the vet typically, there are people that take but there are, chickens. there are people that take their chickens to the vet. Um, most, most things can be, uh, done at home and taken care of. Uh, so don't feel like if you have a chicken, you have to go to the vet. If you don't, if you don't know, uh, ask, there's plenty of people, there's plenty of forums out there. Um, community, I mean, Farmers are, are, there's a strong community in farming. Uh, and so just asking your neighbors or asking people that have are similar like-minded as you uh, can be a real big deal um, and save you lots of money, you know, cause I mean, a vet is a hundred bucks just for a chicken. You think, oh, wow, I can't afford that. Well, you know, you may just need some vet RX, which is $7 in tractor supply. And that takes care of your deal. But there are people who use chickens more as emotional support and so mm-hmm. they will take their chicken to the vet and get it x-rayed in there's nothing wrong with it and that's good for them we've we've never taken a chicken to the vet. <laughs> it's also just good for kind of creating that community of people who are interested in keeping chickens for whatever that reason might be right i'm sure that can help towards changing hoa laws and you know, making people realize that they want to be in charge of their self, um, self-sufficiency in terms of feeding or, I don't know, just opening the conversation to chickens. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, is, is there anything that people should be concerned about or any, any danger with chickens? I mean, maybe hoping to dispel some of the myths, <laughs> right, about how chickens are dangerous. Um, uh, um... I mean, every once in a while, you'll get a an aggressive rooster. Mm. Um, yeah. But that's really in all of our time. We've I can probably think of that's three, true. two that were actually aggressive. And they got called out, and so they're not aggressive no more. Yeah. <laughs> they're they're food. Um, I think um, probably the biggest one that we could think of is that you'll hear a lot is if you're pregnant not to clean out the chicken coop because Mm -hmm. the birds can get toxoplasmosis, which is the same thing. If you hear, if you're pregnant and you hear, don't clean out the cat litter box, it's the same, it's the same disease. Um, It's the same reason that you're advised, bless you, to to not clean out the cat Mm -hmm. box while you're pregnant. So it's a risk. I mean, you practice good hygiene, talk to your doctor about it. Women have lived on farms and on ranches and taken care of chicken coops for, hundreds of years mm-hmm. and been fine with it. I mean, the only other thing would be predators, mm-hmm. but I mean, even at that, they come to eat and then they leave. So, I mean, we have obviously coyotes and fox and skunks and whatnot. Um, I think the only predator that we would, we've actually had to handle would be a snake. Um, and typically the snakes aren't, they're rat snakes just coming for eggs or grass snakes coming for eggs. Uh, nothing venomous, venomous or poisonous. Yeah. So I'm really not any more predators than if you had cats, cats or dogs outside that they would attract mm-hmm. or wild birds. Um, it's the same. They don't attract any additional chicken specific predators that you wouldn't have if you didn't have chickens. Yeah. Cool. Um, I wanted to kind of save this next topic for last. Um, the best ways to learn about chicken processing, since that's something that y'all teach a cl- class on. Um, and I think you have one coming up, right? Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, so yeah, just best ways to learn chicken processing, <laughs> go to their class. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, if there's any tips and tricks that you could share, just here right at the end, um, take it away. <laughs> These are our meat birds. We we do we use Cornish crosses for meat birds. Those are these will clean out, dress out the way that you would see a chicken in the grocery store mm-hmm. packaged. Um, there there is a difference between egg birds and meat birds. There's also dual purpose birds, so they're good for both laying and can 
dress out a pretty decent carcass that you would be accustomed to. And you can process egg birds. It's just not gonna look like what you're used to seeing mm -hmm. at the grocery store. Um, so that's why we use Cornish crosses because that's the ones they grow up quickly. Um, you can process them at eight weeks and they're a full sized chicken in a package. Mm -hmm. So we use a chicken tractor, which is the picture on the right. Um, the chicken tractor is basically just put over grass and we move that on a daily basis. So uh, in this way, the chickens get fresh grass every day. Uh, they also are not sitting in their poop or anything like that. We don't have uh, nesting boxes or perches for these chickens because they do grow at a faster rate. So they, they can't jump never or yeah, yeah, they never get to that age where they need to perch up or anything. Um, again, this the, on the chicken tractor, it, it is um, chicken wire with a hardware cloth around the bottom to keep the predators out. Um, and then we, yeah, we do we process them every eight to ten weeks, just depending on the size. Um, typically, we don't go longer than ten to twelve weeks. So, um, our next class will be the twenty fifth of June. And then, uh, so yeah, I mean, if you want to learn a little bit more about it, it, it is a it's a cool process. Um, it's very hands on. Uh, and yeah, I mean, for the purpose of this, we won't go into too much detail on the process, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a cool process to know how your food's coming. Um, and when you raise them, you slaughter them, and you, you know, okay, what went into that bird? Um, doesn't just give you a more appreciation for the meat itself, um, and what God provided, but it gives you more of appreciation of knowing that. The sacrifice. Exactly. And I'm, and I'm eating something that I raised that I put the, the work into. It's not just going to H-E-B, paying a, a dollar or something a pound, so. So we, we put ours in the chicken tractor because we still want that, that free range life for them, for them to be able to have fresh grass and have bugs and scratch around and not be um, in, a, in a cage, but they do get fat and slow. And so they can't fight off predators or move as fast as the egg laying varieties. So this is a perfect combination for us of them still having that same experience, us still knowing that they've got that, those opportunities mm -hmm. to eat well um, without risking a predator taking them out. And it fertilizes your yard. So mm -hmm. everything that we did last season, uh, our yard is super green, super healthy, super lush and thick. Um, and so now we, we have them on a different part of the property and that area we're using for horses. So you, we can put our horses out there and eat that grass. So it just, I mean, it's a kind of a, a full circle. Um, it's not depleting the, the resources. The ground. Yeah, it's yeah. giving back. So if um, we have our class on the 25th, which will be out here at our place. At our ranch. If you're not close by, find someone in your area who's doing a class. I know there's a lady in Kyle um, that we, she actually processed some of our roosters when we didn't have time to do it. And she has a lot of good information. Um, there's somebody in your area that's doing it. Offer to volunteer to help them process and have your payment be a couple of packaged chickens. Um, there's some good YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. I have my favorite chicken processing video is by Joel Salatin. I love it because he goes into great detail about every step of the way. It's, it's pretty long. Um, it's not BJ's favorite. He likes the <laughs> short and sweet. Here's the list of how you do it. And so there's lots of good resources, no matter what you mm -hmm. like on there. Some of the tools that you do need if you wanted to, to do it yourself, though, would be, you know, a, a chicken tractor or a small pen to, to raise them. Um, what we, they're called hanging cones, and basically it's to help bleed the chicken out um, in a, and make it more of a humane way. Uh, a sharp knife, obviously, or, or uh, something like branch cutters to be able to cut the head off. Um, propane uh, tank and burners and a big pot to spoil water to, to help defeather it. Uh, you don't need a defeather. Your hands work fine. We have a defeather because of the quantities that we do. So it makes it a lot quicker. Uh, heat resistant gloves, uh, coolers with ice baths, rinsing water. And uh, we shrink wrap ours like the grocery store. So when you get something from us, it looks like the grocery store um, in a scale. So you can weigh out your chickens once they're processed and, and know about what you're getting back. Uh, a chicken carcass can weigh out anywhere from, I mean, on a good, good, property, you know, anywhere from six to eight pounds. Um, ours average about seven pounds, um, but we do get them as, as heavy as eight and change and as small as six and change. So 
Um, and that's just a good, healthy, healthy weight. So they're not overweight. They're not uh, too big. They're, they're just a good, good size. That eight week timeline of uh, when it's, when it's time to dispatch them. I mean, there's a big difference between an eight week old Cornish cross and a 10 week old Cornish cross. Mm -hmm. um, they grow really rapidly. And so they actually aren't a great breed to have if you just want to have them for egg laying because if you let them get too big, it's not healthy for them. They, they're organ. too fat. Their organs start, there's no rooms for their organs. Yeah. They can't walk around. They end up just laying they're too heavy to walk around on their legs. So they're bred specifically for the meat. And showbirds, those are typically what you have, like your FFA uh, 4-H market shows. Uh, those are the birds that typically the, the kids will show uh, because they do grow rapidly and, and, and big. So. Yeah, but they're <clears throat> intended specifically for me. Well, I love your focus on self-sufficiency, especially when it comes to the chicken processing um, process. <laughs> I think if more people knew how to do it, we'd have less factory farmed chickens <laughs> as well, and maybe less people eating chicken from factory farms <laughs> if, if they're not doing it themselves, um, which is probably better for, for everyone involved, <laughs> the chickens and us included. Um, but yeah, do, do you have any closing thoughts on um, self-sufficiency, which is kind of, you know, part of your motto or even even just, you know, the therapy also that you do with, with animals just before we move on to the closing and questions? Well, I mean, they are self-sufficient, you know, and if you, you currently buy from HEB or, or a big grocery store chain, uh, find a local farmer, you know, not only are you giving back to your community, but you're getting a healthier egg. I mean, you're not getting something that's washed in bleach. You wouldn't brush your teeth with bleach. So uh, why would you put something in your body that's been cleaned with bleach as well? So um, so it's it's a dual purpose there. It's healthier for you and, and you're giving back to your community and, and supporting somebody that, uh, that you live by. Um, as far as healthy uh, mental health, I mean, they're just good, calm animals to be able to just sit there and watch. Um, we do, we, we are a therapy ranch. And so we do all sorts of therapy, uh, equine therapy, uh, rabbit therapy, you know, just general, um, general therapy, <laughs> mental just health. Watching the yeah. animals if you don't want to even interact with them. It's just mm -hmm. relaxing. You know, there's days that we can just sit on the back porch and just watch the cows and the chickens and, you know, and it's just, it's just a relaxing de decompression, uh, of our busy days. It is really important. I I, I personally, my opinion is that it's really important for people to see the process of what a chicken goes mm -hmm. through, how it is to process a chicken. And even if you don't, if you're not going to commit to only using your own chickens and you promise to never, ever go to the grocery store and get a chicken again, I, I, you don't have to necessarily go that far, but being connected to where your food is coming from. We've, we've offered meat to friends and family. And mm -hmm. We've had people respond to us and say, no, I only eat grocery store meat. I'm like, where do you think that comes from? <laughs> it's, it's really good to know where, where, what you're eating, what you're putting yeah. in your body and the sacrifice that, it, appreciating the sacrifice that, that those animals have made. And the work that goes into it, you know, I mean, every time we go to feed cows, we know that, you know, what they're eating and yeah. where they where, where they've been uh before we process them and we eat. um same thing with our chickens and, and pigs and whatnot and supporting the the farmers and ranchers around you and in all honesty the people who buy eggs from us weekly or consistently get first priority so if there's another snowstorm and um, we've got a ton of people reaching out and we have to decide who we offer eggs to it's going to be the people that support the ranch that have consistently yeah in touch so it's good to get your foot in the door that way <laughs> <laughs> yeah either buying them or raising them raising them uh, <laughs> raising yeah. chickens and, and having yeah. eggs yourself yeah okay well thank you so much for that wealth of knowledge that you shared um i i really appreciate you coming on and just sharing all this basic information about chickens. Um, I, I'm pretty sure you inspired 
some people to raise their own chickens. And yeah, to everyone watching um, now or in the future, you know, please reach out to to our lovely, lovely speakers at um, Team G Ranch. It's just teamgranch.com. And um, it's in the event description. It's, it's in, you know, it's everywhere basically. So um, please reach out if you have any, if you are in the Austin area. Um, and all right, so Tim has been collecting some questions and let's see what we have. I will say this too, if you're raising your chickens and you don't wanna buy everything that needs to process your own, there are some farms that rent out equipment as well. Um, we rent out our equipment to people who raise them but don't wanna invest the, uh, uh, in the processing equipment. So, you know, you can still, if you already have a plan and know somebody there, uh, you can definitely, uh, do that. You can definitely have somebody that's going to, uh, you can rent your equipment from. That's good to know. <laughs> um, all right. So first person, a quest for a garden asks any ways to deal with snakes. I feel like you kind of talked about the one, um, but do you have any other ways that you deal with snakes? This is BJ's least favorite <laughs> part. Oh no. Uh, if you're not scared of rat snakes, you can pull the snake out and with a hand. move it somewhere else or dispatch it depending on whatever your choices are. Um, or if you're like me and scared of snakes, you use a shovel or a shotgun. Yeah. <laughs> it, it depends on, on your personal preference. Yeah. But do know that if there is a snake coming in to eat your eggs, I mean, some people let the snake have the eggs. They know that that's a trade-off, a part of the, the balance, the cycle, and that snake will only, will come back every day for an egg. And that's a, a sacrifice that they're willing to make is to allow that snake to live in their coop and have a couple eggs here and there, but then it also keeps mice away. Mm -hmm. So mm. again, that's, that's a really personal decision. But so you don't always kill the snake. You can always catch it if it's not poisonous and, and move it somewhere else. So. And truthfully, really, what you're going to be getting is rat snakes, and they're yeah. not venomous. Um, they do bite if they feel threatened, but their bite is not venomous. Yeah. Okay. So that certain type of wire, um, the smaller hold chicken wire, keeps snakes out. And if they, you have snakes in, you basically just pick them up and move them, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. Chicken the wire allows snakes in hardware cloth. Keeps them out. Mostly. For the most um, Rihanna Myers asks, uh, if you start with only hens, can you later introduce roosters? Yeah. Yes. Um, another good point we didn't make regarding that was that if you do have roosters in your flock, you can eat those eggs. So nothing happens with, if, if you have roosters in the flock, chances are those eggs will be fertilized and you can eat fertilized eggs. Nothing happens until either they get put in the incubator or the hen starts sitting on it. There's no development at all in the egg. So you can- There's a typically a three day window that you have once, even if you, like we went out of town for a day and came back um, and we have two broody hens, I was still able to pull the eggs out from them because they're only a day old. Um, so they really haven't had time to incubate yet. Um, but more than likely those eggs are fertile because we do have roosters. So. Um, no development. No development has happened yet. So those are still edible eggs. Um, but yes, you can definitely introduce a rooster. It'd be no different than introducing a, a hen. Um, we'd caution no more than one rooster per 10 hens. Uh, and that would be our main thing to say with roosters. Um, how often do you replace or add shavings? I feel like we talked about this a bit, but just to clarify further. <laughs> Yeah, and that's, again, a personal thing. We do, maybe where we highly encourage for nesting boxes, that's a constant Weekly. replacing. Yeah, Daily. anytime mm -hmm. you see poop in there or anything, keeping your nesting boxes really, really clean is important. Um, shavings on the floor, we do every six months or so where we completely clean it out and pull out all the shavings and that good compost that's underneath and start with a fresh layer. 
Um, we do add shavings about weekly, every other week, depending on the weather, if mm -hmm. things get soggy, yeah. rainy outside or dirty. Where do you get the shavings from? We buy ours from Tractor Supply. Yeah. That's what's cool to us. We have a good relationship with our tractor supply mm -hmm. here, so. But yeah, like right now it's raining weather. So once the rain passes, we'll put more shavings out because everything out there is going to be wet. Um, so when it's wet, our hens are walking around in the mud. And then when they go to the nesting boxes, they put mud on the eggs. And so to prevent that from having to wash eggs and, and refrigerate them, we want to make sure that all the shavings are constantly staying fresh. Mm. <clears throat> is there any concern about the birds, like the chickens preference towards humidity, wet, dry, do they, do they care personally or? Probably, they haven't told us. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, but like any animal, I mean, they definitely, I mean, when it rains, they, they'll stay in under covered area. When it's cold, right. they all up together um, in the covered area. So, I mean, they're just like any other animal or human. They don't want to be wet or cold. Um, they want to stay as dry as possible. And so, I mean, but they do yeah. like a, a nice um, dust bath. So yes, you'll see them laying out and the fire pit. Yes. Yeah, they use our fire pit a lot, but scratching mm -hmm. a little hole in the ground and dust bathing. And that's how they keep themselves clean and keep mites off of them. So mm -hmm. I think the other preference would be dry, dry. so they can dust dry. bathe. We have another question. Let's see, is there a breed for meat birds that you would suggest? And then also breeds of birds that are more heat tolerant for Texas? The Cornish crosses Corners, yeah. is what we personally use for meat for birds. birds. Um, there are more heat tolerant birds or birds that like the cold more. The general rule of thumb to know that is like, so when we showed that acorn earlier, I don't know if you noticed that its comb was really big and floppy. And so that allows for more air circulation, um, helps them. It's kind of like how we sweat to keep cool. Their combs help them keep cool. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that if your chicken has a small comb, it's not gonna like Texas. We have, we have all of them. And yeah. they all do well here. Maybe, maybe we could go back through um, just the different, yeah. the names of the breeds in the photos. Let's see, where should I start? This one? <laughs> back one. This um, one. So those on the right, those are salmon favorels. Those are, people either love those or hate those. I don't <laughs> know why. Um, we like them. Fine. They're interesting. They have an extra toe and so, yeah. and feathers. Feet. Um, those are, are really good layers. Really good layers. And they lay really nice brown eggs. Mm -hmm. Like pinkish brown yeah. kind of. Mm -hmm. And they're usually pretty large. <laughs> Let's see the next slide. That red one up front, that, that both of those on the right hand side, those are, see how their combs are bigger. That one in the back, her combs even kind of flopping over. That just, um, allows for that that air circulation for them to help them keep cool. Both of those are good layers as well. Mm -hmm. That's the leghorn and the red island, uh, Rhode Island red. And both of those are really good layers. And those are the white eggs and the brown eggs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The Rhode Island reds are, um, are what we call a dual purpose bird because those could actually be a meat bird as well um, with a different diet and, and whatnot. They can grow bigger as well, so. Mm -hmm. On the left, the second one, the first one is a rooster. The one behind him is a Americana, the East Eggers. Uh, those are the greenish eggs. Um, we have some Australoops and Austra yeah. yeah, frizzles and silkies. Some of those are still checks. We don't have, I don't know if we have any pictures up there of those. Um, we have bantams. Um, and yeah, I mean, really, again, it's a, it's a personal preference answer. Do you do you care? Do you want all white, perfect eggs? Then you want to get a bunch of leghorns, mm -hmm. um, and they do well in Texas. Do you? The, the ones on the right here, the the barred rocks, those also do well. I think those. Um, if you if you look them up, people say they do really well in cold climates and really well in warm climates. So, we haven't found. 
one that doesn't do well in, in Texas. Texas. Um, but I wonder maybe if that's just because they're not down here and we don't have as much access to birds that don't do well in Texas. Right. Mm, we already talked about these breeds, right? I think there was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This one. Another Rhode Island Red. Yeah. <clears throat> that one on the left, I was interrupting her laying time. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> she's staring at you. Yeah, that's her. <laughs> menacingly. Um, and then, and then the roosters. H how would you choose the breed of rooster? Does that matter? Ours um, chose naturally. Ours chose uh, us. <laughs> yeah, ours okay. chose us. So, um, I don't. A lot of ours are from hatching eggs and yeah. hatching straight run. You know, you can't determine there's not a, a female egg and a male egg that you can decipher from yeah. the outside mm -hmm. um, so some of those we just hatched them and they turned out to be roosters and we kept them around um, if you wanted to do specific like if you wanted all blue andalusian you can order all blue andalusian hens and a rooster mm -hmm. and make those together and have all blue andalusian so it's your preference on what you want to so if we have naked neck hens, which is that, that rooster on the right, the white rooster, and we have a naked neck rooster. So if we wanted to get purebred, uh, we would separate them and isolate them into a smaller coop uh, for a couple of weeks, cycle out those eggs. And then after about two weeks, we should be getting purebred naked neck eggs, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Um, but it takes about two, two to three weeks for it to cycle the eggs out to get all the extra yeah, the, other, the other rooster roosters stuff stay in the them. Yeah. So how many weeks did you say? About two weeks. Oh, wow. Two weeks. <laughs> so yeah. they'll still be laying eggs. It's just those right. eggs that they're laying, they've mated with all the other roosters um, up to that point. And so, and those are already lined up in the, in the track. Those are already in the lineup, in the shoot. Mm -hmm. And then let's see, what is this one on the, on the left? She's a little Eastern. Too, so she'll lay some oh, different. Okay. Yeah, she's actually a Favarolli straighter. Yeah, like we think she's a mix. She might be a mix. See how her cheeks have that fluff, and she's got that little beard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Um, all right. I feel like we've covered that nicely. Um, we have another question. Let's see. What can you do to protect chickens from the flu going around, other than cleanliness? You mentioned a few things already, but yeah, anything that's else? actually a controversial topic mm -hmm. in the chicken world right now. Um, you'll get people, it's kind of like the coronavirus, you know, you'll get people saying 100% biosecurity, keep your chickens completely inside covered, use specific shoes only for the coop, because if you're walking from your back door to, to your coop. coop, you could step in <clears throat> dirty diseased poop. I don't know how to say that better. Um, and so you want shoes that you only wear in the coop. Um, and then you've got people saying, we're doing the same thing that we've been doing before and know that it's a risk and hope that it doesn't get here. It's not really in the central, in the, there's, I, as far as I know, there's been one case in Texas so far. Um, part of the problem is birds are migrating down south. And so we might still, we might see some coming this way. As of right now, it's not as big of a deal in Texas as it is in other states. Um, we've kind of done a hybrid of that. We, we are still free ranging. We're no longer throwing scratch out for them. That's not in the coop. So we're not inviting- Extra birds. Yeah, birds <clears throat> that aren't, aren't into our area. Um, keeping things clean. You can wipe the bottom of your shoes with Clorox wipes. Um, we're not inviting as many people out as we normally would uh, to walk around and the people that we are we're asking them to keep their shoes clean yeah. but yeah if it hasn't really hit texas yet i guess that's that's good i'm glad it hasn't um okay i think this is the last question so could you just name a couple of those chick suppliers again um i guess there was one you mentioned that will send them to you yeah, that's Ideal Poultry, and they're in Cameron. Um, that's where 
a lot of the smaller feed stores get their chicks from Ideal Poultry. Um, Windy Hills Hatchery, I think is what it's called, is the is the meat bird place. Windy Meadows. Windy Meadows. Windy Meadows. Sure. Windy Meadows. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, Windy Meadows Hatchery. So um, those are those are Texas places. There's tons of yeah. other hatcheries that are outside of Texas that are more popular. Um, Murray McMurray is one of the big ones that is really popular. Um, they have a whole magazine out or whole order brochure that you can get and they're up north, uh, northern United States. So there are some to be wary of. Read the mm -hmm. reviews. Um, there's some specifics we won't name, but We've heard really bad things about people getting way overpriced birds, really sick birds from, um, and they're continuing to, to, sell. to sell. So if you're <clears throat> looking into one, go online and see what people are saying about them. It's kind of like buying a car or anything else. You want to do your due diligence, just don't jump into it. Um, and so, yeah. But those are those are two of the ones in Texas that we'll use uh, yeah. to, to if we needed to get some uh, meat birds in if we wanted to grow our flock that rather than hatching them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you again so much. That yeah. concludes our event tonight um, of raising backyard chickens in Texas. Thank you so much, BJ and Maura. Um, again, everyone, please look out for the information with this recording, um, with their information, and Tim will be compiling a list of resources that we'll be sending out along with the video. So look out for that. And thank you to Texas Real Foods for hosting this event and connecting us more with our food. We're, <clears throat> excuse me, this event will be able to stre be streamed and watched back, as I said, for anyone who missed the beginning or wants to send the video to a friend, possibly, um, someone who's interested in learning more about raising chickens. And yeah, please sign up for our email list too if you're here interested in hearing about um, other events that are happening. The social circle will be happening once a month. And so, yeah, stay tuned for the next event. And um, also, again, just, you know, if you're in the Austin area and looking for uh, chicken classes, chicken knowledge, reach out to Team G Ranch. Um, and yeah, if you had any other promote any other promotions that y'all wanted to offer before we leave? Um, just reminders to people. Uh, you need a counselor that has a ranch? Yeah, if you're looking for a pastoral Christian counselor, I mean, I'm your guy, but uh, yeah, I mean, we just- We just love talking about chickens. Yeah, farm <laughs> life is our life. So yeah, I mean, encouraging whatever- Encouraging people to- Be self-sufficient, yeah, you know. Take some control back into their own hands. Exactly. And just know where your food's coming from. Knowing the work that goes into it, there's a certain level of pride that comes out of it. So, um, and it's just relaxing. To be honest with you, it's just relaxing. So, that's all we got. That's it. Thank you for those parting words, um, and thank you for to everyone for tuning in. Um, we'll see you next time. So, yeah. all right. Thank you. Bye. God bless. Mm.